how do I do it? Well, I don't think I'm double jointed or anything. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it's it's hard to describe how you do something like that. Anybody else here? Would you compare your style with Dan Crary? No, I wouldn't compare my style with Dan Crary. You mean a comment on comparison of this? Okay. Uh, well, they are two totally different concepts. Uh, even f even from uh, using basic music as a foundation, They're, the concepts are totally different. Dan uh, is a very traditional player, plays a lot of fiddle tunes, and uh, he has a different concept of, about the way the instrument should sound and how he plays it and everything. He holds a pick different, and, you know. Right. He an I think he anchors a anchors a wrist down on the bridge, and you know, just does his own thing. But one thing is for sure, his technique works for him, doesn't it? <laughs> so, anybody else? Uh, who were some of your uh, early influences on the guitar? Well, okay, from the ground up, I'd have to say Lester Flat because that was the first bluegrass music that I remember hearing anyway. And then after that, when I was very young, I met Clarence White, who was also very young, and then... He, I, I was nine years old at the time, and he was 16, and he was like a big kid in the neighborhood. <laughs> and uh, for, he he was the guy that uh, that I set a, that I set my own pattern from was Clarence White. So, sure. <laughs> thanks, thank you. But right back there. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, actually, it's a little bit of all of it, because if you uh, if you look at a if look at a chart of a tune on a piece of paper, most of them are in one key, even though there's you know several different chords. Most tunes you can uh, you, you can sort of stick to one scale or one, or I should say mode, would be the way, and uh, that's what happens most of the time, and you're sort of free to. Uh, just explore the fingerboard while the band plays the changes. Now there are ex exceptions to that rule, of course. Uh, sometimes there's there's certain tunes that require changes that are not within a particular mode or scale, or they change quite frequently. And in that case, you just have to use brain power and and uh, you know either you're improvising or if you don't do that, you got to rehearse. And if you don't do that, you could make a fool of yourself. <laughs> so, anybody else? No, I don't. Uh, I can't think of a tune that I play off of that album anymore. I would, I would love to have heard it myself. I'm wondering why you don't play the jazzy or stuff. Uh, well, I occasionally do some of it from the, from the other albums. It's just you happen to mention acoustics. And uh, the only thing I do off that is occasionally swing 51. If I get together with somebody like Grisman or somebody like that, I might do it. But uh, as far as the other tunes, I you know, they're just tunes that I've done, I've recorded, and I don't play them anymore, so you tend to forget them. Yeah, this is primarily a vocal group. As Did you hear like the set last night or anything? Or to, well, that's that's primarily what I've been doing for two years. See, back when I was doing instrumental music, everybody was screaming, well, why in the hell don't you sing anymore? So, <laughs> yeah, well, it sort of has for the time being, yeah. Right back there. Uh-huh. Well, uh, I, I became interested in jazz and folk music back when I was in my early to mid-teens, and Lightfoot was one of the guys that I heard. And uh, he appealed to me because he he sort of put some seriousness into his level, you know, his own level of folk music. Like he wrote real good tunes and things. And so later on, as I started to sing more and become more musical, musically active, I, I thought that his tunes would be, you know, good vehicles uh, to take and use my own ideas toward. And anyway, that's, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Anybody else here? Um, I noticed in some of your leads, you uh, sometimes throw in what seems like a couple of quick jazz chords. Uh-huh. Did you, did you work that out consciously, or did you just kind of stumble on that when you were improvising? Well, something like that. Uh, 
the more you do it, the more you figure out what will work and what won't. And uh, sometimes I go for it without even knowing whether it'll work or not. But I, I try to keep, uh, I mean, I try not to do anything real drastic, say, within traditional music. You know, I try not to play any real outside chords. Or <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of them that you accumulate, a whole bunch of those substitutions. And you, once you do it long enough, you start to learn what will work and what won't. So. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay, Devlin was written with chords first. It was uh, the best I remember. I had I had started to hear uh, two different sets of chord progressions that I had been fooling around with for a while. So I put them together in the form of a tune, which has a bridge and a chorus. And uh, then after I had the chord structure down, I think I put that down on a piece of tape, and it just kept playing it back and trying to get the ideas of how to make something melodic out of it. And, Anyway, the result was the tune Devlin. So, anybody else? Did you, uh, study music no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Did no, I don't read music either. Wow. But uh, I did take a, a real brief course in ear training. I tried teaching at this school that was in Sausalito years ago. It was called Family Light, and uh, they all told me I was a terrible teacher, which I guess I really am maybe even one of the worst. But uh, but there was a guy there named Wynn Westover that was uh, real good in basic ear training, so I took his course a few times, and and that essentially teaches you to appreciate the value of every note that you hear. I mean, every note you hear, right or wrong, it does have some value. So. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, uh, let me see if I can take an example here. Uh, okay, the question was, uh, well, when I take somebody like James Taylor's tune or Gordon Lightfoot, how do I structure it and arrange it to make a, you know, something out of it that can be useful on a record album? Um, okay, for example, I did uh, several of Lightfoot's tunes on my newest album, and. Uh, there was about three of those tunes that I went into the studio with, with just a lyric sheet. And uh, a couple of them in particular, I had uh, Jerry Douglas was there, and uh, Jimmy Goodrow, and Mark Schatz, and my brother Wyatt. So I sat down with the guitar, sung the tune, and played the chords. And they essentially fooled around with it for half an hour or so. And uh, you, s you start to develop these ideas from this interplay with other musicians, you know. If you're working with good musicians, that's what happens anyway. So in, in terms of how the tune sounds like it is, I think they would be just as much responsible for that as I am. So, and more often than not, that's the case. Uh, to answer the question more specifically, I don't usually f go in with a structure to the tune and make them play or restrict them to play within any particular context. We just go in and play the music, and it turns out that way. Actually, I'm working on two albums <laughs> right now at the same time. One is uh, is a new bluegrass thing that I've been doing. Not it, it's not one of those uh, viable. Yeah, it's not one of the bluegrass albums. This is a is a bluegrass oriented project, which is I think is similar to to Cold on the Shoulder. That record got pretty good response, and so uh, the following one after that, which was me and my guitar, some people thought might have been taken it a step too far. So I figured, well, what the hell, I'll back up a half a step, and then on the next one, I'll really let them have it. <laughs> I have been playing both. Uh, that was my Martin I was playing last night. The Santa Cruz I had worked on by them uh, about two or three days ago, and it was worse when I picked it up than it was when I brought it in. So. Uh, <laughs>
No, that's not to discredit them. I had, had it just so happened that the work that I had done requires a break-in period, and uh, it's sometimes it's a painful break-in <laughs> break-in period. Back there. Yeah, Norman Blake and I finished an album together. Should be uh, two or three months, I would say, at the at the most. What's the title? It's called Blake and Rice. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? When are they going to give you top billing on the albums? Instead of, <laughs> you know, whenever you did uh, Skaggs and Rice, you know, or Ricky got the first one. When's it going to be Rice and somebody else? Oh, well, uh, well, I think there was two theories to that. With with the Skaggs Rice project, I, I think the uh, the concept was to use reverse alphabetical order on the name billing. <laughs> and so by the time it got to Blake Rice, I thought, well, what the hell, I'll turn it around this time. <laughs> uh, You're just trying to confuse <laughs> Anybody else? No, I haven't. My road manager here, Billy Wolf, tried to get me to do it one time, and I sit down with one about five minutes and threw it down. <laughs> no, but that is a good question because uh, people have people have this misconception about electric versus acoustic instruments because the scale length is usually the same and it has the same number of strings and it's tuned the same, but the concepts are totally different. At least for me, I found it out because with an acoustic, it's how hard you can play it. With an electric, it's just the opposite. It's the lighter the touch you have, the more proficient player you can become. Uh, funny. Yeah, sorry. Vinci is the name, V-I-N-C-I. Anybody? Brass or, or, or bronze? Well, I go from one to another, 90% brass, but if I'm in a playing situation where you know, it's real, real hot, and I would sweat a lot or something like that, then I would switch over to a phosphor bronze because uh, the sweat doesn't eat them up quite as fast. <laughs> yeah, my hand sweats. <laughs> you. I don't think it does affect the sound because uh, an acoustic guitar... Uh, the principle of an acoustic guitar doesn't really work from the sound hole forward. I mean, there's nothing there to, to make any sense. I mean, you know, it doesn't make a difference. So, uh, in fact, I would think that they could actually have a double cutaway, and you wouldn't really hear the difference. Well, but I think they look like shit, so I'm... You know. <laughs> but, uh... Anybody else? No, I play it. In fact, I keep it so close to me, it's right there. I'm, I'm not going to let it run off. <laughs> yeah, no, I do play a lot. It's uh, I play quite a bit. It's not as loud as my other instrument. And so uh, here for the past couple of years, I've been playing the other one quite frequently. But uh, anyway, I still play it. <laughs> Even if I don't want to play it, I, sometimes it's expected of me to play it. So I do. Anybody else? Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Certainly appreciate that. Anybody else? A lot of us amateurs have a problem all the time. It's playing a while, sort of reaching a plateau. And it's kind of hard to get beyond that and playing it. I know you're not a teacher. Do you have any suggestions that you can relate to your practice to help someone get beyond a certain level? Yeah, well, there's a couple of different things. Uh, where most people fail is the basic essentials of music, believe it or not. Most people, I think, have the ability per to be proficient melodically. but And also, most people, particularly students, make the mistake of starting there melodically as opposed to basic steps of uh, tuning, timing, and intonation. And uh, those things can be very difficult to develop. But if you, if you take them separately, all right, timing is one issue. I'm one of the worst time bugs in the world. I hate musicians that play out of time. I can't stand it. But uh, anyway, timing, if, if you don't have anybody to play with that you trust, get a metronome and sit down and learn how to make the metronome slow up and speed down. Do you see what I'm saying? Learn how to, learn how to groove with a metronome. Outside of that, you're as good as the band you play with. Remember that. So if you can find yourself some people that you trust and that are in time and in tune, 
play with them as much as you can because they'll give you feedback and you'll in turn give them feedback and you know, you'll start to play off each other. Anyway, I hope that answers the question. Anybody else? No, I don't like to use a pickup. Well, uh, did you see my article on guitar player about them? Anybody? Huh. Well, I don't want to say I'm against them because they have a purpose, particularly for people that play with, uh, you know, that like, like to try to incorporate acoustic guitar into either rock and roll or country music or something like that. Well, then they need that amplification. But uh, it's like the, the means of amplification itself, like a pickup on an acoustic guitar, the principle doesn't work and the, the, the sound is bad, right? So, uh, I mean, has anybody here heard a pickup on a D28 that makes it sound like a D28? Well, okay, there's... <laughs> anybody else? Japan? <laughs> without going there. Yeah, without going there. No, uh, that's, that's a real tough question because I've heard that they're around and that they're even less expensive now than they were years ago. And, uh, but there's only one music store that I know where you can go in and buy them and they're real good. It's called Picker's Supply in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, so if somebody here is real desperate for them, you might just drop them a line or something. As for tortoiseshell picks. Anybody else here? Right there. With Pat Flynn? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, no, I, to, to be honest with you, I haven't thought about doing an album with Pat Flynn, and I doubt if he's thought about doing one with me. <laughs> so, no, we're very good friends, but, and uh, Pat is a very good musician and very good person, too. And uh, But... Uh, they're like it would it would be like Dan Crary and myself doing an album. It, it, this the styles. I mean, there's nothing that much in common, except maybe you could tack the word old time music or bluegrass on there, and that's in common. But in terms of like the tunes and the concepts, they're totally different. Anybody else? <coughs> Come on, people, don't be shy. I mean, you know. <coughs> right there again. Well, okay, practicing is something that I haven't done in years. And sometimes it shows, but uh, I, yeah, I just play. That's to me, that's practice. Uh, and as to how long I've been playing, I'm 36 years old, and I don't remember starting. So, <laughs> over there. Yeah, okay, now that <clears throat> that concept with myself and Norman, uh, that might even throw a lot of people into thinking that, well, this is going to be another one of those old-time records with a lot of hot licks on it, you know? And uh, it's not it's not that. There's more vocal on it than anything, and Norman is playing 60% uh, mandolin. And so uh, it's, uh, and there's a couple of, well, it's actually two or three original tunes of Norman's and some other goodies that we dug up together, uh, New River Train, and uh, I'm coming back, but I don't know when. You know, some old Monroe Brothers classics that are on there. It just seemed like hearing those comments, it seemed like some of your styles were different. Yeah. Uh, Dan Curry, and I wondered, you brought some curiosity to why you would say the lemon. Oh, right. I see, I see what you're saying. Well, uh, I mean, that's as best as I can answer for now is that we we did find that common element at least Blake and I did and it was in the music itself you know as opposed to like trying to play Blackberry Blossom and see who could outplay the other one or whatever you know right right anybody else right, right there uh huh well uh, I think in that sense all arpeggios are chords, right, to some degree. It's just a matter of how you uh, t stack the individual notes together. You know, and it works the other way, too. It's like chords, uh, like, for example, you can hold a chord position, and if you play the individual notes one at a time and in some given order, it could make an, you could build an arpeggio from that, too. You know? And I think I do a little bit of both, but I do it subconsciously. In other words, I, I don't think about it when I'm doing it. 
No, not, uh, you know, I just do it by ear. In other words, if I do it, it's something that I'm not aware of. I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to be so vague about it. But, yeah. Would you like to break into a more commercial type music and um, major record companies and mass marketing? No, uh, I am signing with Columbia Records, but it's not for the purposes of making a, a commercial type record. In fact, if I had to make a commercial type record, I wouldn't sign with them. I'll put it that way. Uh, I'm not into prostituting myself as a musician, so I hope that answers the, <laughs> hope that answers the question anyway. But I do what I do, and whenever I try to expand my own music, I always do it with the hopes that it'll reach a wider audience. And if that happens, then I'm grateful for it. If it doesn't, then maybe I'll give a stab at something else. <laughs> right there. Well, I've done some stuff recently with uh, acoustic piano and bass and drums as a rhythm section, and I'm sure I'll be doing more of that, you know, primarily vocal-oriented things. You know. So I found out one thing, the voice will make a hell of a lot more money than the guitar will. You know. <laughs> anyway, anybody else? Well, oh, sorry. All right. Uh, if there's a music store written for that album, like the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's, I heard they didn't know how to read when they cut that. So they gave it to these academic musicians to listen to that band. Wrote the music score for it and sold it. Right. Do you, you have that done to your music? Uh, where it come out? Your album would be the music score to be published, yet, but it would be done by somebody else. Yeah, it is done by somebody else, and uh, sometimes it's done unbeknownst to me. And whenever it is, I try to sue the hell out of whoever did it. But uh, <laughs> but I have been real lucky. It's been. No, he's correct. I'm not a literate musician. Anyway, go ahead. Because I've heard, I've heard other students say, like, take a, a Stevie Wonder song or something, and you get the, the music score for it, and you try to read it, and say it doesn't, it doesn't represent what his record was. It was just written by some guy that was paid by Stevie Wonder. Right, I see what you're saying. Some, uh, some sheet music that you buy for popular music is very crude, I think. Uh, at least that's what I've been told. It sounds like, uh, for example, somebody might go buy the sheet music that's available commercially, and when they end up playing it, it sounds like something you'd hear on an elevator or in a supermarket, right? Anyway, yeah, uh, I don't think that has been done to my music yet. I hope it hasn't. Um, in fact, all the comments that I've heard from people that do read and have read my transcriptions, they say that they're all real good. And so, and I usually try to screen the people that do it. I mean, you know. Ask somebody, well, how reliable is this guy? Mm -hmm. So and, uh, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you. Oh, God, no, man. Sometimes it's a nightmare. And then sometimes it's just the opposite. Sometimes it, uh, it's very rewarding, indeed. It's, uh, no, it's never really that consistent. I wish it was. You know. How was last night? What do you want, a scale of 1 to 10? Well, I, I, I would really be afraid to speak for the guys in the band, but I'd give my own self a 3. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> anybody else? Right there. No, I think Wyatt would probably shoot me if I stole that tune. <laughs> no, he, he, Wyatt, Wyatt's going to be working on his own album. I mean, I don't know how many of you heard him, but he's he's starting to be a monster on a guitar. You know? In any case, he'll be doing his own album, just like I did my first one, and you know, I'm sure that he'll use as much original material as he has. Mm -hmm. But maybe he'll ask me to play rhythm on it for him. <laughs> Will we ever see a Tony Rice complete songbook? 
as a matter of fact, a friend of mine and also a person that does uh, an occasional column in Fretz magazine named John Carlini, who's a person I learned a tremendous amount of music from, uh, is doing a book. He's doing one on David Grisman, and he's doing one on myself. Well, what I've heard is that they want to present it with uh, some solos, transcriptions, and then, you know, some bio material and some photographs and different things and a color cover and all that, you know. And so, uh, then that should be out. And, well, I mean, Carlini and I have already started working on it, so, you know, as to when it'll be out, I would say uh, give it a year at least. You know. Anybody else? Right back there. Well, the way I handle it is if I can't hear it in the first five or ten minutes enough to play it, then I usually tell them to go get somebody else if they've got the wrong guy. No, that's, that's, I'm, I'm serious about that. I can, uh, that's just one way that I do it. Most of the time, people that, that call me to do session work for them, they, they call me with that in mind. Uh, that, you know, most people know that I don't uh, read. And so they figure, well, if they want specific parts, they will call somebody that does know how to read and play exactly what they want. But people hire me for my improvising capability and, and really nothing more. That's just about it. Mm -hmm. How much do you charge for your session? How much do I charge? Well, it depends on who it is. You know? <laughs> no, that is a very good question. Uh, that really varies. At times, it has been union scale quite a bit or, you know, what... what I mean, the scale is just a, uh, itself is just a guideline. Somebody like myself or David Grisman or Jerry Douglas or somebody like that would, would uh, bill for what's called double scale, which is essentially two union scales. Uh, that's for people that I don't really uh, consider to be that close of a friend or whatever. Like if I call Jerry Douglas up and ask him to work for me for a dollar, he'd do it, and I'd do it for him too. I mean, we don't really do that to each other. We, <laughs> you know, like we, uh, there's a group of us that pay each other real well. So, because uh, <laughs> you pay them well, and uh, they they come back. Next time you call them up on the phone, they don't say, oh, I got something else to do, or what, you know, over there. Well, the ones that don't read music uh, do read charts. Okay, I you know use Jerry Douglas again as an example. He's really become uh, a heavy figure on the Nashville session scene. You know where he does a lot of sessions for other people, and uh, they have their own chart system. And he has since learned to read it and learned to read it real well too. And he does that. But in terms of like reading music, I don't think he does. Uh, Sam Bush, to my knowledge, reads music, but. It's one note every three seconds. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And then again, there are people like Richard Green who can read anything you can write. You know, It's like uh, he can just sit down and play it and do it. So, uh, anybody else? Do I know why he has or... I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Would you have a feel for why Ricky's gang might be getting more popular and they might have more airtime on country radio? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, well, a couple of things. He, uh, he has found his niche in terms of like what's, uh, what I think of as a reasonable compromise between playing what he wants to play and what he has the ability to play and what gets wide public acceptance, too. And... You know, couple all those factors with the fact that he's got CBS Records working with him, and then there's your superstar or whatever it is. <laughs> so, what else? Do you have any latest songs or you Can I play one of my latest songs or something I've been working on? Uh, I haven't been working on anything. <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, uh, I was trying to think if there's. The last thing that I that I have wrote is already out on the records. So it's, it's an instrumental called Port Tobacco, and it's on me and my guitar. That's the last thing I have out. And I don't even know how to play it because my band doesn't play it, and I haven't played it since I recorded it.
Anybody else? They're pretty much advanced. Uh, uh, there's a there's a series of homespun tapes, which uh, there's I think maybe uh, 20 or 30 minutes of of the first tape. It's first of six tapes, is devoted to uh, you know like tuning up and things like that. But in terms of like, I mean, well, it gets back to what I said a while ago. I'm a terrible teacher, and there's six audio cassettes, and uh, which is which is a total of six hours worth. And there's also a video that's 50 or 55 minutes, and there's more to be learned, I think, from the video than all of the audio put together combined. Because uh, the advantage of the video is that if you, you can freeze the frame anywhere you want to and see exactly what's going on, if that's what you want to do. I wouldn't recommend anybody do it or try to play anything exactly like I do. Back there. Mm, there is quite a few of them floating around. There's even a couple of bootlegs out there somewhere. But uh, no, nothing that's been like released. Uh, no, nothing like that, huh? I don't know what I don't know what the reason is for that either. I I don't really push that issue that much. I'm sure there'll be some in the future. Anybody else? Well, let's see. Uh, I play anything from public hangings to uh, car wash grand openings and, and, and all the way up to uh, places like the Kennedy Center <laughs> in Washington. So, no, uh, to be more specific, uh, I do a lot of club dates, and the ones that I do, I try to make sure that they're, you know, of reasonable quality. Uh, I do quite a few college concerts, and old, old theaters is my favorite type of performance and uh, I do a few festivals which with the exception of this one and a couple of more is my least favorite type of event to do especially the ones back east is usually hot and muggy and rainy and muddy and things like that <laughs> yeah and <laughs> it can be cold <laughs> anybody not, did, did I answer the question yeah well I've been to Europe and Japan and I'm going to Europe in about a week and a half so uh but it's mostly here in the United States, yeah. What do you have back there? Yeah. Oh, I liked it a lot. I thought it was great. Great. That's that's an example of what I type of shows I like to play, and I've I've been fortunate that I played quite a few of them. Yeah. And some of them are co-bills too. A lot of the times, like with Norman and Nancy, and then occasionally with the New Grass Revival, and then you know a few of those dates I think have been with Nancy Griffith and people like that. Yeah. I mean, I work with, with a lot of different people, and those happen to be my favorite, is when you have a co-bill uh, situation where you don't necessarily have an opening act. You know, that's, I mean, I, I, I would prefer the co-bill to a warming, or to a warm-up act situation. Right. Anybody else? Over there. I've been accused of being eclectic, but uh, uh, let's see, uh, it's a tough one to answer in a way. I do a, I, I do a lot of different music forms, but I, I always play the same. <laughs> it's, it's like a, the music does come out sounding different. And uh, well, it's just a matter of, of what kind of concept. And I am just one musician who chooses to like segregate those different concepts, like, you know, Church Street Blues is one concept. I don't know if you've heard that album or not, but uh, that's one concept of just, you know, a guitar and voice, and then there's duet things with like Skaggs and Norman Blake, and then there's instrumental things, and then there's the Grisman Days, and then there's bluegrass projects. and. Right, well, see that... 
has or, you know, some particular room? Well, if you could categorize what I do for a living, then I'd be real rich. But you, kind of, you can't categorize it. I mean, I don't think there's anybody here that can put a name on this unless they call it New Acoustic Mountain Folk Grass, uh, uh, whatever, you know, I mean, uh, jazz grass <laughs> or whatever. String music, I always liked that one. It was string music. If you categorize what you do, you might be more. Well, I very well might. I don't know. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Back here. Yeah, you people out here are more laid back, man, you know. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, well, there is a difference. Uh, this, is, this, this is not really to put down any particular place that I've played, but one of my least favorite places to play in terms of audience response is Texas. Now, I don't know why that is. Uh, uh, and my favorite place to play of anywhere I've ever played on the globe is New England. Audiences in New England are, are uh, generally more attentive and more receptive at the same time, too. Well, I, I do the same thing. I mean, you know, in other words, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't try to tailor the music uh, to suit a particular audience or, you know, especially one that might be in a different geographical location. Uh, that's a, it's a real tough one to answer, but uh, I don't know. If, if it changes at all, it's due to, like, feedback from the audience itself, you know. If I walk out and, you know, I'm met with a, like this, when I play a show, then I usually play like shit. But, you know, if I, <laughs> it's like, so that's the way that works. And in, in some places, it is different. Yeah, you're fortunate, though, that... Uh, and I'm fortunate, too, to be in a place where the audiences out here, especially in this part of California, are real, real good. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Are you going to play a song for us? I don't think so. Yeah, I am. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do about an hour and a half's worth of yeah. tonight. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> Anybody else? Right there. Oh, uh, I forgot. I I forgot that tune. Uh, there are tunes that you record and then you leave them alone. Just like somebody asked this old shipbuilder about the Titanic, and he said, "Well, we just builds her and then shoves her in." <laughs> and that's the way some music is. It's just exactly like that. Uh, there's been so many tunes that I've recorded and that that people would want to hear. But I, for, for whatever for personal reason, haven't built up the enthusiasm enough to sit down and relearn them. Like the other night, I announced a tune that I had learned off of a record of my own. And I said, here's one that I learned off my third album. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Huh, okay. That's, uh... <laughs> that 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 kickoff is uh I'm notorious for blowing that kickoff. I'll tell you just about ninety percent of the time I blow it. Last night was one time I think that I didn't blow it. But uh and there uh, you know, that brings up another point. There's some things well, okay, for example that kickoff was ten years ago. Well this is ten years down the line and you know, if you don't play every day, you learn to uh I mean you you forget those things. And that's one that, you know, that's the reason that sometimes I mess it up is because I don't play it every day. And uh, in terms of trying to dissect it for you, it would be useless for me to try to do it because I would show you wrong, I'm sure. <laughs> so, anybody else back here? I'm sure there are different musical categories. Uh, in terms of putting a name on them, I, I wouldn't know how to do that. Uh, for example, people call me a bluegrass guitar player more than they do anything else. And uh, I'm as far from a bluegrass guitar player as you can get, I guess, in terms of that. In terms of bluegrass music per se, I mean, I think of a bluegrass guitar player as, 
has Lester Flatt and Jimmy Martin and Del McCurry and Charlie Waller and whoever, you know. Blue, that's bluegrass per se, so uh, on that level, I, you know, I, I don't know. It's a real tough one. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there is, like, for example, Dan Crary, Dan Crary is, uh, he's one musician who sort of restricts himself to fiddle type tunes on a guitar, right? And uh, Doc Watson is a person that takes, uh, I think he uses old time music and, and the tune itself, you know, as a foundation for the way that he plays. And so, uh, and then you got Russ Berenberg and, you know, different people like that that create their own thing. So, and I don't know which of those categories that I would come closest to. I, I don't even know. Right here. Well, there are dates that I do in the summer where I do have a banjo player. It's J.D. Crow. Okay. Uh, I mean, I don't do it all the time, but... Uh, and I got an album coming out with uh, bluegrass stuff with Bill Emerson as a banjo player. So, uh, uh, oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> I, got this, I got this short list of, of a few of them. J.D. Crow, Earl Scruggs, uh, Bela Fleck, Bill Emerson, Alan Mundy, Bill Keith. That's a few. No, well, uh, I don't know. Bela Fleck might do some some live dates with me this year, and if that's the case, then you know, I mean, he has before, and I'm sure he will again. So, uh, yeah. No, I don't. I always feel like an idiot when I start listening to those players. It's like they're so good that I, you know, I, I, I use that part of. Uh, music to listen and not to try to play <laughs> oh a lot of people uh uh several horn players in particular john coltrane i really like a lot and eric Dolphy and ernie watts if you know who that is and uh, uh you know let's see uh who else do i listen to a lot of keyboard players too like bill evans you know an acoustic acoustic trio and things like that a whole a whole wide range of miles davis Really like, well, the older Miles Davis stuff. Okay. Anybody else? When you travel with your guitar, do you have to check it with baggage? Yeah, I do. Begin, uh, yeah, well, sometimes it is. Sometimes I show up in you know, at a gig somewhere and I don't have any fingernails left, you know. <laughs> right there. Uh, five eight nine five seven. You're one number off. Oh, nine, yeah. oh okay. Well, meet five eight nine five five. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, you did two numbers away. How about that? Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, I didn't like. It sit down with Clarence White. I mean, there's a lot of people that think I did. They sit down, I mean, they, they think that I sat down with Clarence and he showed me this and showed me that, and that was never really the case. We were just sort of buddies together on a Southern California music scene when we were both real young. <laughs> yeah, back there. Right, okay, uh, <clears throat> again, uh, audio and video instructional tapes is a real good source. Uh, if everything goes right, what I'm going to do in the future, which I think might be helpful to guitar players, is most of my music is stored on multi-track tape, where all the instruments are on discrete tracks or channels. Well, <clears throat> I think what I'm going to do at some point is I'm, my engineer and myself are going to go through those and take out me, right? and then uh, uh, present that as an instructional thing in itself, as sort of like a, bl uh, you know, a, a bluegrass minus one series that somebody had out or whatever. And, uh, well, uh, <laughs> but, uh, I, I, th I think that that, you know, I'm, I'm starting to get into that as a motif, or, you know, or something that could be a valuable learning tool is to, is to like, you know, 
you know, have a, have a section of the tune that is intact, just like it is, and then have the same section, less me or less any other particular instrument or whatever, you know, could be, I think, an invaluable learning tool. Because then you get to play along with it. Not only that, but you get to play along with some good musicians. <laughs> uh huh. Now, what do you mean lyrics? I have I'm. Yeah. Well, first off, I don't write my own. I mean, I have it in ages. There was one about ten years ago that I still detest, and uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't like my effort at it, so I quit. Other people's material. Yeah. Right. Right there. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Well, I think, I think even in, uh, t even to the general populace, there's something about it that's obviously fascinating. Because, uh, and uh, in terms of specifically what that fascination is, I'm not really sure. You know, uh, I heard it when I first heard music. I was fascinated by it because of the uh, rapid succession of notes played from a five-string banjo. That's you know was what was real appealing to me, and so. Uh, and I'm sure some people feel the same way about uh, fast flat picking or whatever. I, I don't know. You know, it's it's a really t tough one to answer. Get any I'm sorry. You think you'll get any Will I get any faster? Uh, I don't know. I may or may not. It just depends on the requirement of a given tune. I'm trying to slow down. If you want to know the truth. No. Uh, any, anybody else? Yeah, back there. You. Thank you. Uh huh. Mm. Uh, yeah, they're just scattered out on different albums. If you you can find a touch of some of that stuff even on the instrumental things that I did. You know, there, yeah, there's, there, I don't think there's one particular album that would be uh, a, a source <laughs> for, for that that you could use as a learning tool. I think you might list, try just listening to all of them. You know. Anybody else? How do you do it? How do you do it? <laughs> Again, practice, you know. Okay, any, anybody else out there? Yes, there is a machine that will do that. And so, uh, what is it called, Bill? It's a, uh, it's a harmonizer. With a harmonizer, you can slow something down without making it sound growly, right? Or no, uh, or can you? In digital format. In digital format, you can. It's probably real expensive, but it can be done. Uh, but in terms of, you know, for, for practical home use, the best thing would be to take a, a you know, reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder or a three-and-three-quarter speed cassette machine or something like that and slow it down. See, even when you slow those things down, you can steer, still hear the fundamental note. And that's all you need anyway, really, is that. In terms of, like, hearing it tonally, you're going to apply your own tone toward that tune. So, yeah. Anybody else here? Right there. Make it slow up and speed down, right? Yeah, that kind of thing. Like, what, you know, what, what are you talking about? Okay, uh, yeah, it's real simple. You play slightly ahead of the beat and slightly behind it. Now, if you play slightly behind the beat, then you're going to make the metronome sound like it's speeding up. And, vi and see, uh, vice versa, too. If you play, you know, ahead of the beat or whatever, then you're going to make it sound like it's dragging. So, 
and that's what that's what music is. That's what makes me sound different from Doc Watson and from Dan Crary. Is that that's I mean that's just another thing in particular besides tone and you know a different selection of tunes is timing. Uh, uh, you know that's that's the reason I say if you can make a metronome work for you, then you're doing pretty good. You know if that's I mean that's that's a goal that you could set right there. Somebody just told me get five minutes. I brought this instrument here for somebody to take a close look at it. If anybody out there wants to take a close look at it, I'll hand it to you right here. And if you promise not to break it, you can look. <laughs> anyway, anybody else with another quick question or two before? There's not a show that I do where I don't have it, and it's sometimes it's so bad. I, 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 you know, I mean, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't believe the extremes. I, I've had like left hand cramping so bad that I've had to use one finger to finish the solo, and uh, and right hand too. I've, I've occasionally got a problem, and people like Grisman have had it so bad that he got tendonitis sometimes. You know. <laughs> like that. Doc and I have played together a number of times. Uh, the only thing I can think about that he that he would be talking about was uh, uh, Doc and I and Norman Blake and Dan Curry judged a, a workshop or judged a guitar contest years ago at Winfield, Kansas, and then we played a concert after the after the uh, thing was over. And I think somebody taped it. I don't know who it was, but maybe that's what he was talking about. I don't know. I'd like for all of you to hear it as long as I get paid for it. <laughs> anyway, I'll leave you with that. Uh, somebody has told me that I have to go somewhere else. So, uh, anyway, this has been a pleasure talking to all of you, and I hope you've learned something. All right.